Yes, eels. In Hecate's second floor hallway, she kept a massive freestanding glass column of salt water filled with mores because, she told us, their toxic mucus was good for potions. That was more information that I needed to know. Four long yellow monsters glided through the tank, wriggling around coral and fixing me with their soulless blue eyes. Hecate showed us how to feed them from a nearby freezer full of dead fish, but she needn't have bothered. The eels were telling me all about it telepathically. Their thoughts chiseled their way into my skull like ice picks. She feeds us six times a day, said the one who thought of himself as Larry. Only feed them once a day, Hecate said. We get the twenty fish each, said another eel, Fortuano. One fish each, Hecate instructed. And the pole cat looks tasty too, said the eel called Bigwig. We can eat the pole cat. We'll figure it out, I told the goddess. I get along great with sea creatures. Feed us all the things, warned the fourth eel, Janet. Or we will bite you. We were off to a great start. A half dozen side corridors branched off from Eel Hall, each lined with black lacquered doors stenciled with creepy Art Deco skeletons. Art Creepo? These are bedrooms, Hecate said, gesturing down one of the corridors. But they are only for the lucky acolytes I train in magic. Annabeth looked interested. Do you do that often? I haven't for many years, Hecate sighed. Once this mansion was a school for magic. Weird concept, I muttered, because sometimes I blurt stuff out that should not be blurted. It was just, I was having trouble imagining students running around the house, zapping one another with wands and making potions out of eel mucus. Before Hecate could smite me, Annabeth jumped in. Hecuba mentioned that the school closed. Why was that? Hecate gave the hellhound a withering look. We don't talk about the school if we want to remain a happy family. The dog tucked her tail between her legs. On Hecate's shoulder, the polecat chittered, probably teasing the hellhound. Grover cleared his throat. <clears throat> so, where do we sleep then? He sounded worried, since sleep is one of his favorite things. Hecate hesitated. If I were a betting man, I'd guess that the question of our sleeping arrangements hadn't occurred to her. You may camp in the living room, she offered. Awesome! Grover grinned triumphantly. I'm glad I brought extra bedrolls. I imagined myself sleeping under the iron candelabra, waiting for it to fall and cut me into the shape of a sugar cookie. Or maybe I'd stretch out on the grand piano next to Gail the farting polecat. There were so many options. What about bathrooms? I asked. Hecate frowned. Another mortal necessity she probably hadn't thought about in years. The need to flush. She gestured vaguely down another corridor. You may find rooms with baths down there. You just created new ones, didn't you? No, she snapped. Now, down here, you will find the library. Also off limits, I guessed. Hecate arched her eyebrows. I don't limit access to Bucks, Percy Jackson? I am not a monster. If you think you can navigate the knowledge in my library, be my guest. But if that knowledge turns you into a flaming purple armadillo, don't come crying to me later. I made a note of which hallway she was indicating. I didn't want to stumble around at night looking for a toilet and find myself in a room full of hazardous magical textbooks. Plus, the warning about the armadillo sounded oddly specific, 
like it had happened before. Annabeth, however, had a gleam in her eyes. To her, knowledge was irresistible. Even the flaming purple kind, which kind of troubled me. Grover raised his hand. And is there a kitchen? He pointed to Annabeth's bag of Mexican food. Our tacos and enchiladas are probably getting cold. He definitely sounded worried now. He liked eating even more than sleeping. He really liked enchiladas, which he said were so important they deserved a separate category from food. Hecate scoffed. Of course I have a kitchen. Although we call it the laboratory. It is in the basement. Follow me. She led us down a different stairwell. How many were there? I got the sense that the house was way bigger than it ought to be, as if the inside, like the outside, blurred and blended into the surrounding buildings. I hoped I didn't wander into a neighbor's house by accident and surprise them in the shower. The hellhound Hecuba padded behind us, still looking morose from her mom's scolding. She left a trail of drool, which I suspected would make it easy to track her comings and goings. The polecat Gale was still perched on Hecate's shoulder. She had a talent for waiting until I was directly behind her before ripping a stinker. The basement turned out to be the brightest and most spacious area of the house. The white stone floor gleamed like ice milk. Windows let in bright light through frosted glass, which was weird since the sun had already started going down. Maybe each bank of windows existed in a different time zone, at just the right time of day to capture the perfect light. In the center of the room stood a line of stainless steel workstations that reminded me of morgue tables. Along the walls were enough white granite counters, mixing bowls, blenders, cutting boards, ovens, and range tops to keep an army of chefs busy. Displayed in glass-doored cabinets were hundreds of jars, vials, and beakers filled with colorful liquids. Gooey objects floated in some of them, and I really did not want to know what they were. On the nearest stove, several covered pots simmered and steamed. Hecate spread her arms proudly. I know what you're thinking. This looks like the set of The Great Witch's Brew-Off. And you're right. We filmed all seven seasons here. Oh, I love the episode with the growth elixirs, when Alejandro turned into a Hyperion giant. <laughs> a classic, Hecate agreed. Season three, episode five. I glanced at Annabeth, who was as mystified as I was. Maybe we could find the show on Hecate's TV and binge it this week. She probably had a subscription to Olympus Plus, or whatever the gods were watching these days. Grover sniffed the air. What is that heavenly smell? He followed his nose, past the simmering pots that did not smell heavenly, to the farthest counter, where an old-fashioned ice cream maker rumbled away, a silver canister churning in a wooden bucket filled with crushed ice. I haven't seen one of those in years. Whatever was inside smelled of fresh strawberries ripening in the summer sun, just like the fields at Camp Half-Blood. A drop of pink liquid trickled from the canister's rim, and Grover was shaking as he tried to restrain himself. The aroma was so powerful, even I wanted to dip my finger in it and have a taste. You will touch none of my projects, Hecate warned. They must all be allowed to simmer on the stove just as they are till I return. I will make an exception, however, for this strawberry milkshake experiment. Grover's eyes widened. You will? Tomorrow, at precisely 10 a.m., it will be the proper consistency. I will allow you to unplug the motor take the canister out of the ice using safety gloves and transfer it to the freezer over there. That is all you may do. Absolutely no taste testing or there will be dire consequences. Do you understand? 
Grover looked like he was trying to swallow a golf ball-sized lump of disappointment. He nodded glumly. Good. Otherwise, you may use the kitchen to prepare food as you wish. Now, enough about your mortal needs. Let me show you how to properly care for my pets.